Hello and welcome everybody to a, a webinar with BigCommerce and Data Art. In this webinar, we're going to be sharing information on how to start and optimize a direct-to-consumer business. Today, we're going to be focusing more on the why you should, as a manufacturer, be starting a direct-to-consumer business. In later presentations, you'll hear about the how and the best practices to scale that business as well. My name is Daniel Fertig. And I've been in e-commerce for about 15 years now, and I've seen a number of companies build out a direct-to-consumer business successfully, and I hope to share some of those tips with you today. I'm joined by Dennis Baranov of Data Art, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Yeah, and the same way, I worked for Data Art around 15 years, and I have quite tech background, so I understood how to build technical solutions. But last couple of years, I global head of retail and distribution practice here in Data Art, where we help different clients like Akada or brands like Unilever in different things. And I'm more than happy to share it experience from our perspective, from, from the client perspective. What does it mean direct to consumer approach? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, in terms of agenda for today, uh, we're going to go a little bit through the goal of this two part series for how we want to help you build and scale a direct to consumer business. Dennis will share a little bit more about the market overview for fast moving consumer goods and some of the trends that he's seeing in direct to consumer. I'll share a little bit about some of the advantages that you can benefit from in going direct to consumer, as well as some of the challenges you may need to overcome with respect to the operational needs of your business and the technology needs of your business. And then I'll hand it off to Dennis to go through some of the requirements building and the foundation for how to get started and those key considerations as well. So why are we doing this? Well, for those not familiar with BigCommerce, we are a fully hosted e-commerce platform serving 60,000 customers with over 200,000 stores in production. Everyone from Skull Candy to Ben & Jerry's to General Electric use our software to sell products both B2B and or direct to consumer as well. Um, it used to be that if you were a manufacturer or a brand, your entire success was, was going to rise or fall based on the shelf space that you had at a big box retailer. Those days are long gone. Those brands are being disrupted by a number of digitally native direct to consumer brands who are looking to displace incumbents on those shelves and in the hearts and minds of consumers everywhere. So the goal of this series fundamentally is going to help brands and manufacturers adapt to those macro trends that may be impacting your business to help you scale revenue and grow profitability as well. With that, let me hand it off to Dennis to share a little bit about what he's seeing in the fast moving consumer goods overview. Yeah, thank you. And it's great you mentioned about disruption because any change usually starts from the disruption. And uh, fast moving consumer goods market are growing and it's growing significantly. But again, it have a different, uh, let's say, ideas behind the crawl. And it was a joke, which probably everyone already here what's driving our digital strategy and is it COVID-19. And that's true because during the COVID time, many of us start to do more online shopping. And it would not be surprised if uh, provide possibilities to brands grow their online presence at the same time as uh, retail shoppers and also if you talked about that it's more and more brand created to be first a digital native and as you mentioned most of the brands try to get our attention from different perspective not go through the let's say traditional retail shops but go through the different instagram facebook uh, accounts or activists and they get our attention from that and just after that start to be listed on more traditional shops. And sometimes you could not find your great brands from that shops again, because you have a problem with the listing. And many of them working right now on online trust strategy and try to do not full switch because it's not possible to do full switch. Yes, so we already go into the shops and as soon as we can do that, we return to that habits but to add into our habits, go online and get, I don't know, our favorite ice cream or pair of shoes or whatever you prefer directly from the brands because it's provide many opportunities for the brands. And 
brand reputation, which I mentioned here, it's also one of the quite large driver behind this thing. Because when you go to, I don't know, your favorite uh, offline shop like Morrison's, Tesco, or whatever you prefer, these shops don't worry about what you will buy. They want to increase the typical check, but brands worried about that. And if you try to get relationship directly with your customers, you could see what happens. And that's also influence to the market. You could see some numbers there, but brands try to provide the better price. Brands try to do free returns, etc. And it's the same what large organizations like online aggregation platforms could do. And in some, it's all provide some really huge push to go online for the brands. Do you see the same for your clients? Uh, we absolutely do. And, and I see some of those stats on the right hand side. I mean, all of those, whether it's pricing, whether it's the delivery fulfillment and, and even the boxing experience, right? The packaging experience that you can provide directly to the consumer, how they shop with you. I think of convenient delivery, not just as the actual uh, physical delivery of the product, but the overall interaction and experience from, from browsing to receiving the product online or in store. And that's all part of convenience, right? And how consumers like to shop. Free returns as well, right? I mean, if you're, um, if you don't have a direct to consumer uh, business, whether that's brick and mortar and or digital, and you're entirely reliant on the third party retailer to sell your products, you're not in control of the communication from a returns standpoint. You're not in control of the policies of those returns. And if uh, you, know, you go and return a product as a consumer, to your point, Dennis, the retailer doesn't care if you return one product and replace it with another brand's product. Whereas if you own the direct to consumer relationship, you can do things like uh, incentivize the return of free returns for your product in store only. Unlimited free returns in store and your own uh, sales associates and your brick and mortar locations can then try to upsell that customer into a, a better fitting product or a related product that might look better on them if it's, for example, fashion and apparel. Right. Or if it's a consumer electronics business, a, a television size that's better for their room. And so you can control the pricing. You can control the delivery and the overall experience and fulfillment. And you can control the experience of returns and reducing rate of return or at least replacing rather than an outright return of those products as well. If you own that direct to consumer relationship. Right. So this was a good overview of like the overall market for fast moving consumer goods. What are some of the trends impacting direct to consumer specifically? Yeah, thank you. And you could see a couple of trends there. And I want to start first of all from direct communication with buyers because all of us understood right now how it's important direct communications and also many retailers or brands or producers right now experiment quite a lot what they could do with data because if you communicate directly you also own data of your um, buyers and this provides you really powerful mechanism behind the scene you could do different machine learning algorithms or data analytics algorithms to predict actually how many items you will sell this month which type of items, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it provides power for the brands which they usually do not have enough. Uh, previously, brands tried to solve that problems with different loyalty programs because then you register in loyalty programs for your favorite brands, you provide pretty the same information, and they could get that. But because right now they have opportunity to get that information directly, they could get it better easily and use it for different purposes. The second thing which you already mentioned is control because then you work with third party and you have such kind of control, but it's probably half of the points during the journey. If you start to do direct to consumer, you have 
full control on pricing, distribution, merchandising, and any other aspects. And you actually could play with that parameters as well. For example, if you go to the new market, you could reduce pricing, which probably not easy exercise if you're working with third party providers because they still don't want to reduce, I don't know, the marginality or they don't want to disrupt market. But if you direct market owner, you could do that easily because you want to get additional market share for your brand. And it provides many different interesting instruments, which previously, again, was not on full control for brands and they could do it. And it's continuing with globalization because I know right now, after two years of deglobalization, it's probably strange to hear, but it's still there. And uh, if you want to go to a new country, I don't know, for example, Austria, and you already have operation in Germany, it doesn't require to you as a brand create new warehouses and create full logistics. It's so many possibilities how you could do it from your main base before you invest into that heavily. And you could try it easily again if you're working directly with your consumers. If you're working not directly or via third party, you still have to go to retailers and to push them to list your new products. And it sometimes could be not easy journey because in different geographies, it's different preferences. And again, many retailers prefer to work with already well-known brands. So it's good for us as consumers as well because it's increased competitiveness between brands and we have more and more possibilities to get new interesting things on the market and probably for better prices. Uh, another thing which impacting quite a lot that strategy, it's actually a platform. So the platforms like a big commerce provide a large advantage for both retailers or brands itself, because instead of invest quite a lot into the initial step, they could start to build the uh, new digital web shop quite easily. And again, they could use many plugins which you have and they could increase possibility to do it without major investment because no one wants to do major investment in the start of the journey right. before they prove return of investment would be good. And last but not least margins, you, you could keep it all. And again, uh, for many um, brands, it provides them possibility to provide better deal to the customers or actually invest into the new products or as you say, to the packaging or to free returns because they're in full control of that. Mm. And that's probably why the major brands. Um, and, Sorry, that's probably the five the major trends which I want to talk about. Do you see any others which impact as well? Yeah, well, so what's really interesting to me is really all five of these, um, in many ways, what it's alluding to is like freedom, right? It's freedom for the brand to not be beholden to distributors or to retailers that can dictate terms. So you know, whether that's the freedom to test a new market, whether that's the freedom to test new pricing and promotion strategy, a new brand, a new collaboration, having a direct to consumer channel allows you to test and learn and then scale what works and throw away what doesn't in a way that if you're entirely reliant on third parties, retailers, distributors to sell your product for you, you, know, you lose that freedom the ability to test and learn, test and learn new messaging, test and learn new packaging, test and learn new promotions, test and learn new product collaborations or product innovations or introductions, test and learn bundling, test and learn new market entry, right? And so really new channels for marketing. What we're really talking about here is the ability to be agile and the ability to test and learn what's best for your business. And that is really the foundation for the rationale for building a direct to consumer e-commerce business. Obviously we all want to grow revenue, grow profit margins, um, but I'll touch on five key fundamental benefits of building direct consumer business now, right? So the first, and Dennis alluded to this, is first party data collection, right? You're not reliant necessarily on building out a massive loyalty program to start to collect information 
about who those customers are. And I'll touch on these lightly because we, in our second part of this series, we'll dive deeper into these benefits and exam examples of how customers are capitalizing and optimizing for each of these benefits as well. Um, but you own that customer at the end of the day, if you're selling with a direct to consumer strategy and you can own the personalization around how and when and where to be messaging those customers, uh, whether that's SMS, whether that's email, whether that's at home, you actually have the ability to learn more about that customer as well. In terms of the ability to test and learn, um, you know, you want to be nimble enough to try new things, new promotions that I touched on before, and scale those successes, right? If everything that you do requires some massive go-to-market program or some massive technology investment, that's not a test and learn mentality. You don't want the waterfall approach when it comes to innovation, right? The ability to, to be agile and try new things is um, you know, increased by an order of magnitude if you own the channel directly. The third benefit is the ability to be truly omni-channel in a way that's hard to do if you're relying on distributors, okay? Now, you might be selling your product through e-commerce, through a third-party website or a marketplace, or you know, through brick and mortar locations of your partners as well. But when you're truly omni-channel, when you're multi-channel as a customer, you're able to test and learn different things, right? I used to joke all the time that you know, five years ago, Amazon was a marketplace and, and Meta or Facebook then was an ad network, right? Now Facebook and Instagram shopping and all those things, and it's as much a marketplace as Amazon. And Amazon's, I think, the third largest ad platform in the world, right? And so um, you can try new things. You can try B2B sales um, on digital. You can try employee stores on digital and test new products. Um, test new product introductions, right? The ability to try new channels, whether that's social commerce, whether that's a mobile app, right? The more you own of the direct consumer relationship, the more you're able to try things. The fourth benefit is the ability to cross promote products, create bundles, create subscriptions, run limited edition products uh, to your channel directly, differentiate the buying experience with you than through you know, a big brick and mortar retailer and test to learn new things around loyalty as well, right? You may want to engender an affiliate program, have brand advocates and reward social influencers, right? If you're really just working through third-party retailers, it's hard to, hard to tie that to a commerce purchase. Whereas if you have your own direct-to-consumer product and, and business, you can actually create those programs and tie direct to transactions on your own properties. Tying back to the first point around data collection, if you know more about a customer, right? So I have at home five-year-old boy, a four-year-old boy, and an eight-month-old daughter, right? Um, there are direct-to-consumer businesses out there that sell me uh, toilet paper, they sell me diapers, they sell me wipes. They now know, because I've been buying from them on the commerce direct-to-consumer for several years, they that now know that my four-year-old is out of uh, diapers and has been working on pull-ups and is about to graduate pull-ups from pull-ups, right? So they can try new, new things with me. They know about my family and they're able to recommend and promote additional products. And even in the delivery itself, if you're a multi-brand uh, manufacturer, like the consumer packaged goods company I reference, you can drop different samples into the package that you send me in my subscription every month for me and my family to try new things. It's harder to do, it's harder to negotiate. It is, yes, it is possible if you're a massive brand of influence, but that is harder to negotiate if you're relying on third-party retailers to do their subscriptions and promotions and purchasing as well. And last but not least, you know, in this era of, you know, we all have the attention of, of a goldfish at this point. In fact, we have, as consumers, have less attention than a goldfish. The average goldfish has an eight second attention span. You have on average 1.5 seconds to engage a consumer on your web property for them to consider transacting. If you own the customer experience and you own the UX, you're no longer just a product detail page on a third party retailer's website. You can differentiate with really neat, neat video, storytelling, visuals, right? You can appeal to the consumer with your brand story in a way if you own the direct consumer experience. You just cannot do pre and post sale, even post click experience and messaging. 
if you own the direct, direct to consumer relationship versus if you do not. So what does that actually look like? And as an example, I'll tell you the story of a brand that we work with today that um, maybe a well-known brand for many of you, Method Home, Method Soap. Um, I myself am a consumer and I had historically, you know, thought about purchasing through brick, brick and mortar retailers. Um, this company realized that they had built enough of a following and enough of a direct to consumer relationship or brand awareness that they thought it was worth their while to build a new direct to consumer channel. And as they expanded their catalog, thought it worthwhile to think about new product collaborations, new designs, uh, new bundling promotions to be able to make it worth their while to send you a package to your home as a consumer versus allowing you to walk into a brick and mortar website and make that purchase on their brand when it was just alongside all the other brands this hour. Okay. So in this experience, uh, Method Home started an evaluation in 2019. To date, historically, they'd only sold through those retailers. They ended up picking big commerce and were live in uh, under 90 days. They went from picking a vendor to a live transacting site in a quarter. Okay, so it doesn't have to be that hard to do. Okay, they've gone through multiple iterations. They're growing like gangbusters. Today, they have 50 products that they're selling direct to consumer. They're creating a unique bundle and save options, right? So you can get the dish soap, the laundry detergent, the hand soap, and a number of other products. They're doing a ton of social selling. They have uh, followers on social channels that they're now able to tap into in a way that drives to a transaction and a conversion. And what's interesting about this, and we'll talk about some of the challenges, is you know they're fulfilling directly through a 3PL, right? And we'll touch on this in the challenges, but there is a consideration and there are challenges. You know, If you're historically used to shipping on pallets to large retailers, how do I then all of a sudden create a package that goes to a direct uh, consumer's home? You know, they're using an expert in the 3PL space to do exactly that. So what are some of those challenges? Dennis, feel free to weigh in on some of these as well, okay? Mm -hmm. Two big buckets that we put these into. The first is around business and operations, and the second is really around the tech stack and what does that look like. In terms of business and operations, it kind of goes without saying there, there needs to be organizational buy-in to sell direct to consumer, okay? If this is just some person's side project, I'm not saying you can't be successful, but it's going to be a lot harder because of all of the different elements and aspects of a business that need to play a role in the direct-to-consumer strategy. Right? Everything from product development to shipping to marketing and how you think about your marketing, those are all key elements of organizational buying. The second is uh, what I said before around fulfillment. You really do need to rethink about how you're gonna get your product into a customer's hands. If you're used to shipping large pallets to big, big brick and mortar or big box retailers, or even you know local mom and pop you know pharmacies, for example, you need to think about how that packaging is gonna look, how the fulfillment will work for selling you know a single product to a single customer. You need to rethink organization of the, the digital teams as well. What does it look like if you're if you're selling online but free B2B today? You know, that's a different motion perhaps than you know a, running a promotions and a merchandising strategy for a direct to consumer business as well. Okay. Um, organizationally your mar whole marketing strategy and the mix might need to shift as well. You might need to think about you know your SEO and your paid advertising for specific products you might need a specific brand strategy or product strategy and you need to think about what does arbitrage look like from a paid advertising standpoint on specific products where consumers might be spending time okay that could be uh networks and publishers of websites where your product all of a sudden resonates with direct to consumer direct commerce call to action you know call to action being you know, transact versus download a coupon to walk into the store or just brand advertising. So more direct response, more uh, call to action around transaction. And you may need to think about your product and pricing strategy, both from a you know, channel standpoint, meaning if you, know, you might have a relationship with some retailers and they need to be the lowest advertised price. So how do you figure that out on your own pricing strategy, direct to consumer? And you may wanna think about your, you need to think I should say as a challenge, your product strategy and the direct-to-consumer side. 
Are there going to be products that you only make available to certain retailers or only make available to your direct to consumer strategy? Are there going to be brand collaborations and bundles that you only make available direct to consumer versus third party websites? You need to be thinking about all that. Last but not least, customer service, of course, looks different for a direct to consumer business uh, than it does for just a, a pure B2B business where you're selling to retailers, you're selling to distributors. Anything I missed there, Dennis, or anything you want to you add to that? Um, I don't think you missed something, but it's great you mentioned organizational change because when any producer starts the direct to consumer journey, it's the same as ask mouse to be a cat. They previously worked for quite a while in that space, but they never done it directly with the consumers. And in your tech points, you have another really good point around customer data management, because it starts to be really, really important as soon as you start working with direct consumers. All of us know so many rules around what we could have on that data or we should not have and that data in future. And again, when you worked with, I don't know, large retailers, they already go through that journey right. because they know how to operate in different spaces and do not save some critical information about us without encryption, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it could be quite easy to forget about that when you build new system because you already have some information systems there which operate for quite a while, but previously worked with organizations and that's completely different space. And all other points which you mentioned in tech space, it's really important because if you talked about, again, direct to consumer in current world, your organization has to be digital enabled. Mm -hmm. If you do not have idea how large your stock in warehouse, if you do not have idea uh, how to operate with your delivery partners and do it again efficiently and for online and provide all to us as the end customers delivery window. You probably have so many issues around that mostly immediately because we already had that experience from retailers. We want to have the same experience from you as a brand. So I think it's really, really important to remember when you start the journey you have to stop and think about that, how you organize that. I will talk about that a little bit later, but it's really great points which you mentioned there in Tech Challenger. Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. And even you know something as simple as I, I list the e-commerce platform, obviously an area where I have domain expertise. But if you're used to you know working off of POs with a large retailer, um, and you you all of a sudden need to figure out how you're going to handle a seventeen dollar you know, online transaction and be PCI compliant and secure and scalable. Like those are really important considerations for your business, right? That you may not be thinking about today if you're not going direct to consumer. Let me tell a story and I'll hand it off to you to share one as well, Dennis, of a customer who had to make this shift really quickly. Okay. So a customer, you know, many people who are listening may be familiar with Nokia, uh, also known as HMD Nokia. Um, like a lot of companies, and you alluded to this earlier, Dennis, um, you know, they had historically had a reliance in a traditional model of distributors, right? You'd walk into the Verizon store, right, or the AT&T store, and you'd get a physical handset in addition to potentially a phone plan, for example, or you can walk into a Best Buy, right, or a Cons, and get your product and also the hardware and also potential phone plan. When, uh, when, when COVID hit, they were caught a bit flat footed with, with respect to that reliance on third party retailers. Like they were reliant on you and me walking into a store and buying a physical, uh, uh, physical phone. Okay. They shifted quickly and needed to scale quickly okay so they ended up launching on big commerce they went live in under 10 weeks uh and in uh the uk and ultimately went live in 14 countries the following four um but they had to do a lot of those same things that you, you and i just talked about around like what is our what is our product mix? how do we have ch avoid channel conflict 
really under under a quarter's time out of necessity you know necessity is the mother of invention um they're a company that was able a big company that was able to adapt quickly to changing times and capitalize on uh, technology like big commerce and they use contentful as their presentation layer that scales and can get time to market quickly as well the we talked about building the right tech stack you know, I just want to give you a flavor of what this tech stack looks like for them. I mean, this was not a simple implementation. They were using SAP for uh, S4 HANA for all of their B2B product or organization management globally. Um, They're able to integrate that into big commerce They're using SAP for the CRM as well, using big commerce to power search merch, order management, uh, obviously handling the transactions as well. Um, and using Adyen and Avalara for, for payments and tax collection. So the point of this story is if you pick the right partners from a delivery standpoint and from a tech stack standpoint, and you get the organizational buy-in, in this case, the organizational buy-in was, oh my God, if we don't go direct to consumer, we could end up out of business, right? It's very easy uh, when there's desperation involved to get organizational buy-in. Um, if you're still needing that organizational buy-in, though, share a story like this, right? So your company doesn't get flat-footed. The important part here is from a tech standpoint, a tech platform standpoint, the right agency and implementation partner like a data art, the right tech platform like a big commerce, if they have integrations largely off the shelf, although now it's off the shelf, but at least pre-integrated, then a lot of that tech stack work that goes into launching a site like that um, can be accelerated, right? So what I love about this story is, um, you know, it's a, it's a, they picked a modern SaaS solution like us, right? That was fit for purpose and best of breed. They were able, because we're pre-integrated, uh, they were able to still have a, a best of breed solution. They're a complex business, right? have a bespoke need for integration, but they were still able to go live relatively quickly as well. Dennis, I know you have a story that you wanted to share as well for more in the traditional consumer packaged goods space. Yeah, but also it's pretty interesting how that stories are connected because you just talked about your customer have to make the decision on the pressure. Yep. And the same for us as well, because let's imagine you are on ice cream business and everyone like ice cream. I like ice cream, my son like ice cream and you do not have any problems. You will like ice cream as well, it's great and it's so many flavors and then you go to the park you could bought it from your park based cafe or van ice cream van or whatever you want but covid again changed the play mostly completely you could not go to the park you could not go to the cafe and uh, if previously our customer worked quite a lot with wholesalers or with hospitality sites or with different restaurants, they do not have ability to do that. And it's reduced the part of the market quite significantly. People do not stop to eat ice cream. They continue to do that at home. But again, they get ice cream from the large retailers and they get ice cream which large retailers have. And they do not try to get some additional flavors, etc., etc. So our customer made decision again pretty quickly and what's also interesting in your conversation it's pretty similar on that story choose the right platform as you say it like a big commerce so you could do it quick because when you have such criticism you you have to move quick and again you probably don't want as many retailers or consumers or producers to invest quite a lot into that and you want to try to it easily and fast. And then you choose the right platform, you could do it uh, as our customers in two and a half months. So from the start of the project to the end, and they start to work directly with this consumer. They already have that consumer base and some people actually try to find into internet where we could buy our favorite ice cream, but they do, do not have chances previously. And another probably interesting outcome of that story, then you create new model of the business. So you start to sell directly to your consumers. You probably could um, add some additional value if you think about who is your consumers. And that's also our customer done. Previously, again, they worked mostly with large 
brands, wholesalers, etc. So they do not go to the local ice cream shop directly. Right now, because they already work directly with me as a consumer or with you as a consumer, what's the difference between us and local shop? They probably bought a little bit more. They probably want to get some additional items like ice cream machines, etc. But it's not a big deal to add some new subcatalogs into that. So they created new type of the business again, just started from direct to consumers and after that increase it to more small business uh, type of customers. And that's I think it's a great story because they could combine different approaches and provide some additional value into that. That's but right. Then, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say going direct to consumer, of course, doesn't preclude a brand from still maintaining its retail and distribution business as well. So the smartest businesses are doing this, you know, in tandem. Yeah, yeah and uh, if you talked about that, probably let's go to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about steps to get started, because I think it's pretty yeah. important it's to a, talk it's about. A great, it's a great segue because <laughs> The two examples, it's worth noting, you know, those were companies that pivoted uh, to building out a direct-to-consumer business out of desperation. Um, if you're listening to this webinar, hopefully you're not yet desperate and you're planning ahead and you want to understand the steps to get started and how to think about, you know, building a foundation. Yeah, that's true. And uh, as any journey in our life, it's a good thing to stop before do something. I'm working in IT industry for quite a while and honestly mostly half of the projects which not so successful is because we do not stop and think before start to doing something. And uh, it's a couple of really simple questions which already was mentioned by us on that webinar a couple of times. Yeah. Do you have all buildings block? Are you ready for your journey? Did you miss something? And in one of your examples, you also mentioned you could use some partners like uh, 3PL or 4PL providers, etc. And that building blocks could be bring quite easily into your current picture. So you actually could create everything and do nothing physically if you want to. Also, do you have really good partners to do that? Do you understand your current tech stack? Is it old, new one? And some other questions which we talked about technology. But also, and you mentioned in your conversation a couple of times as well, set your goals. What is your goals? What do you want to achieve? Because if you set a goal- Yeah, that's exactly right. To... And, and, and I, what I tell about you know what those goals will be right yeah yeah and as soon as you set goals you actually have to understand your direction and your consumer base who is your consumer because probably it would be not entirely the same part of the market which you operate right now because your part of the market is probably people who go into like local shops or others but as soon as you go directly to the consumer or you go directly to online, you probably work with a little bit different groups, which more familiar with technology and have a high expectations from the different perspective. Well, the second point or the third point, which is really important to understand your audience, because your audience probably would be a little bit different from audience which you have right now. As soon as you go to online or direct to consumer, you have ability to talk to with more broad audience. Or if you previously want to shift your brands to younger audience or to different geography, again, you could do it easily because you will not have such limitation in physical world which you have previously. And to go online, it's probably a good idea to start small and use one brand, use one geography as you A-B test and try to understand what will work, what will not work. And after that, you could easily scale it without any problems. But if you go big, you probably could face many challenges which you do not face previously again as returns, operations, etc. So just do it small and try it. And actually, my advice 
you should start it today. If you don't do it, think about that because many of companies right now in that market and uh, it's not the small step, but it's also not so scary step, which you probably thought previously. Yeah. And if you start in a manageable way, a scalable way, and you set reasonable goals and expectations, then you can, you should today about it and, uh, you know, have a plan for how to scale it, but it's okay to start small. Yeah. And also it couple requirements here is that we already mentioned most of them, but again, then you start your journey, probably do market analysis, do trend analysis and try to find your niche or again, try to find your best geography or any other things. Data governments, we already mentioned, it's pretty important when you start working with your uh, customer data and you could not do it without good data government strategy. Again, right now, if you want to try something cloud, probably a good idea because you could do it easily and many clouds available and supported by big commerce. So you would not be limited by one. And again, start to think about your roadmap challenge strategy, because as again, already mentioned, you will do quite a lot and you have ability to have real multi-channel strategies. So try to get as much as you can from that. And the last thing, because right now customers will be communicate directly with you, customer service, you could not underweight it. It's really important because it will give you possibilities to get so good attention from your customers. But if you do it badly, you will lose them mostly immediately. So just invest into the customer service a little bit more than you do previously. Yep. It's great advice for anyone else who's interested in getting more personalized advice for their business or free readiness assessment. We would love to hear from you. You can email daniel.perdig at bigcommerce.com or dennis.baranov at dataart.com. Uh, we would love to hear from you directly. Always happy to have a conversation about your readiness, about best practices, and how to get started with selling direct to consumer. Please be on the lookout for the next version of this webinar around best practices for scale your, scaling direct to consumer business. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate your time and talk to you soon. Bye.